Hi everyone and welcome to my brand new podcast, All or Nothing with Anita Nicole. I'm so excited to share this journey with you as I introduce you to people who share some of their lifelong stories. I hope their stories inspire you and ultimately help you to elevate your life. This has been a lifelong passion of mine, so I really hope you enjoy this podcast. I look forward to the feedback and if you have any questions or comments, please do share. Now it's time for us to elevate together. Hi Frida. Hi, and thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Before we start, I'd like to say that this interview contains adult topics. And I'd also like to thank you so much, Frida, for taking the time out to share your story with me and my listeners for my All or Nothing series. I really hope that everyone can learn something valuable from you and be inspired by your fearlessness and impeccable strength. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Frida, the story started when you were invited to a casting call whilst living in London. Taking it back to the first interaction when you were initially invited, can you tell us a bit about how this casting was presented to you and how it progressed from there? I met a guy on the street, which sounds very red flag already, Mm. because I was like, hmm, who are you? Yeah. Um, But he only, he said he's casting for a commercial. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's my card if you want to come to the casting. He wasn't pushy. He didn't say, come here, let's go. He just gave me his card and said, hey, if you're interested... You can come. Yeah. And I was thinking, because I come from a background of modelling mm. before I went into acting and, and school and stuff in London. So it was actually quite normal to get a card yeah. from a photographer on the street. street. Yeah. And then you kind of go, well, it's up to me if I want to do it or not. Mm-hmm. And I went home and I checked him out and he looked very legit. Yeah. Well, you can find back then, you know. Yeah, website and everything. Yeah. Website, photographs, look like any photographer that I've worked with many times. Yeah. So I called him up and I said, yeah, um... I'll come to the casting and I did mm-hmm. and the casting was completely fine it was uh, a female assistant there and there was you know the whole shebang of like tea coffee fruits the backdrop camera you know and he took like a couple of pictures yeah you know, full frontal side side body and because thank you so much I'll let you know if the client likes you mm-hmm. and then I left so it was you know no red flags at exactly all. and then so I went home I'm thinking okay great because mm-hmm. it was quite well paid as well. And yeah. I thought, being a student, I thought, oh, you know, this could pay my rent for like six months. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then he called me the next day and said, the client loved you. Would you like to do the job? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, yeah. And I even thought, because I, I didn't have an agent anymore. I stopped yeah. modeling when I was 20, 21. You know, wow. I didn't really enjoy it too much. Yeah. So um, I thought, great. I don't even have to give the agent 10% or 20%, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, this is good. I said, yeah, I'll come along. You know, thinking in my head of the scenario I had seen the day yep. before. It was all fine, yeah. All fine. Female assistant, fruit, coffee, blah, blah, blah. I thought, yeah, of course, great. Yeah. And then this time, um, he gave me time. And so I went around. I said, it was middle of the day. It was mm-hmm. like noon. You know, it wasn't even 11 o'clock at night or, you know, yeah. wear sexy clothes, mm-hmm. nothing. It was just, yeah, come along. I said, okay. So I went along and knocked on the door just how I'd done before. Yeah. And he said, hi. Come in, come in. And as I, as I step in, he stepped around behind me to close the door. As you would when you let someone in, you close the door. Yeah. This time he locked it with three locks. And the last one was with a key. Yeet. And he put the key in his pocket. Oh, my goodness. And I was like, what? my brain couldn't quite comprehend it yet. And I was thinking, well, wait a second. Something is severely wrong here. Yeah. And there was no female assistant. There was no fruit, no coffee, no backdrop, no cameras, nothing. It was just dark. Oh, my goodness. I was like, what? Um. So that's that's how. And then he, and then he kind of walks around me, and he pulls out a hunting knife. Mm-hmm. He doesn't threaten me with it. He just yeah. holds it by his side. But that's threatening yeah, enough, enough. Actually, I was like to freeze. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I just froze. And then I just said, I need the toilet because I literally thought I need to use the restroom. I yeah, like, panic set him so. My goodness. Uh, so then I, and he let me go to the toilet and, you know, he took my bag away from me. And as I'm in, the toilet is tiny. It's the fifth floor up. So I started looking for things, weapons, yeah. anything. Window or anything. There was a tiny window, size of a laptop, literally. Like, yeah. Like, and I was even considering squeezing yeah. out through that window. But I looked down and it's five stories into a little tiny concrete backyard with trash cans. And I was like, that fall is going to be bad. Yeah. And this area was Harley Street, did Harley you? Street. That is absolutely mental yeah. that this could happen in Harley Street. Yeah. It's such an affluent area in London. I know. And like to think that there was a lady there the day before and they was all in on it. 
It's absolutely terrible. Yeah. Oh and my I'm goodness. sure I'm not the first yeah. or the last. Oh my goodness, Frida. Um, regarding your escape, were you planning it for a while before that moment or did you attempt many times before this? I was drugged a lot. Mm. He gave milk, which I, I can't drink milk to this day. He gave mm. milk with something in it, mm -hmm. some sed sed sedative. Yeah. So um, I obviously wanted to escape. I What happened was that day he gave me milk and he handed me some dirty underwear literally a used underwear in a in paper bag disgusting. and um i was like what so and he forced me to put them on and i put them on and i already drank the milk and mm. i last thing i remember is really bizarre visuals i'm standing in, there's like a fireplace a big fireplace very posh yeah apartment, very posh posh furniture and uh he had a massive pizza next to him which is like i don't know i remember just looking at this round pizza thinking why is he having a pizza? And that's the last thing I remember. Like, it's just you know, weird what your brain does. Yeah. But he sat there with a knife on the, like, on the armrest like this and had me, like, in underwear. And, but then what happened is I woke up in a different place. Oh, my goodness. So I didn't even know where I was. Yeah. I woke up in a um, below-the-ground apartment with the bars on the window. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, yes, I wanted to escape. I didn't actually even know where I was. As yeah. soon as I woke up in there, I realized I was alone. Yeah. I did the tour of the apartment. And there was a bedroom which I was in. There was a kitchen, like sort of an open plan kitchen. But all the drawers, all everything was taken away. Even the lights in the fridge. So there was no weapon for me. Yeah. I even tried to get like um, a door, door frame off yeah. just to see if I can like, you know, yeah. stand and smack him over the head or something mm -hmm. you start going like you know, yeah Angelina and Joe Leeds type thing go how can I you know I need to do something yep. but you also do the whole pleading thing mm. I'm like you know I have a mom and a dad and they're gonna miss me I have a boyfriend he's gonna call the police you know you start this whole yeah and he doesn't care no at any point did you think like he was really going to like harm you or kill you or anything well I didn't know I didn't know what yeah. he was planning to do with a knife I thought he could just be a crazy person who's just gonna cut me up and then put me in the tents mm. you don't know so I didn't find out till later that, of course, um, he was selling me. Terrible. I'm so sorry. Thank you, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard. It's it's still actually hard to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I get a little sweat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. So your escape, did you... Was it a door he left? Yeah, sorry. You, it's okay. Your question was, did I plan it? I tried to escape a few times, mm. you know, but... It didn't work. Mm. What happened in, in this particular day, I think he got really stressed. I don't know because I didn't really get to know him. Yeah. But he came rushing down. He was, was very stressed. Put this on. He threw some underwear at me. Put this on quickly. Someone's coming in a minute. And I was like, half drugged, half sleeping, half stuff on. Half... I was like, okay. And I held on to the clothes and thought, what's the stress? And he literally ran out, slammed the door, and then didn't lock it mm. which he probably thought i'm so drugged yeah i'm not even gonna yeah try again try it. also someone's coming in literally a minute so how how far can i go wow. yeah i think i can only imagine that's what he's thinking oh he was so stressed he didn't but he locked the door all the other days yeah and i remember sobering up instantly and mm -hmm. i was thinking i didn't hear the lock yeah i didn't hear the lock what something is and then i thought he's testing me He's standing outside with a knife and yeah. saying, if I escape, he's going to just, that's it. Yeah. He wants to see if he can trust me. So scary. So then I went to the door and literally put my ear against the door listening. And I could hear footsteps mm. far away. I, went, I didn't know where I was still. Yeah. So I'm like, could be anywhere. Are they coming here? They're going away? And they went more and more faint. And I, thought, I need to try. I need to try. Yeah. So life. I had some of my old clothes that I arrived in thrown in a pile by the door mm -hmm. like jeans and a sweater and so I just picked up this pile like this and thought there was no time it's now or never yep and I just really quietly opened the door thinking any second now he's gonna go wow I mean my heart was probably beating inside my face mm. I was like <laughs> and then I opened it opened it there was no one nothing happened and I thought I'm just gonna run yeah so I ran up a set of stairs which was all like carpeted and then I got to the same entrance that I came in a okay. few days ago. And I thought, oh, oh my God. So I was just downstairs yeah. in a flat that he's also rented. And then I just bounced through the, the rolling door yep. out on the street and I just ran. Yeah. And I just ran and ran and ran and ran and ran. Wow. 
Oh my goodness. Um, I believe I read somewhere that when you first reported it to the police, they didn't actually believe you, um, as they found it hard to believe something like that could happen in an area like Harley Street. How did that make you feel? And were the perpetrators ever caught? That's a very good question. Mm. And I'm almost, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it because I feel bad for those two cops. Mm. They were two young, ki- young guys. Oh. So I, I went there quite late. It took a few days for me to gather up my strength to even go to the police. Yeah. So my friend said, you need to go to the police. Yeah. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to say? I felt so embarrassed. Mm-hmm. So I, I, um, I went to the police. I decided to go in the same area. Yeah. And I went in and they said, hi, what can we do? How can we help you? And I was like, well, I got locked in an apartment. And uh, there was a lot of guys there. And he goes, oh, all right. Do you want to come into this room and give me some details? And I was like, okay. Thinking, oh, you know, there, there is a young woman, very vulnerable. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, come in. So two guys sat down with me in this room. Very, like, nothing. A table and two chairs. Mm. And one guy was standing. And I'm going, this, and they start asking me questions. And one of the questions was, so did he force you in? I was like, no, he didn't. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, all right then. And I was like, doesn't mean that I went there voluntarily. Exactly. For the reasons that he had in mind. Exactly. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I was, you know, it was, and they, they just didn't believe me. They were like, well, you know, we can we can look out the apartment. They did look at, look for the apartment. They yeah. went there and they did actually let me know that, they did let me know that they went there and the guy had a cell phone, a pay-as-you-go that he threw away. Mm. And then the apartment was rented by the week, cash, yeah. and all the furniture was included. Mm. So they said he's gone. We can't. Find him, find him. Yeah. My goodness gracious. Were there any emotional or physical effects that you experienced after the ordeal? If so, how did you manage to get through them? That was one quite bad. Mm. Um, I sat in my car and I was going into town for something else to see a friend. I actually don't remember why, but I was driving a little, little polo. Yeah. And I was driving. I used to drive through that area because I, I was living in Primrose Hill. I used to go around the park, Regent's Park, and then go down and go through that area to go in a park. Yeah. Because back then there was no congestion charge. <laughs> And also no cameras. Yeah. You know, there was, no, it would be much easier to, to catch someone, yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I drove through and I, I ended up on the same street facing the building. Mm. And without even noticing, suddenly my, my hands started shaking violently. And then my legs and my whole body, I was like, oh my God, I had to pull over. And I just sat there and shook. Yeah. Just shook and shook and shook and sweated. And then I was crying and then, I, you know, and then it, it went maybe... 15, 20 minutes, it yeah. went, and I was able to drive away, and I've never gone back to that street. Yeah. Ever. Oh, my goodness. How long was you there for at that apartment, if I may ask? Three days. Oh, man. And how old was you at that time? 24. Oh, my goodness. It's absolutely ridiculous. And was you here living by yourself? I lived on my own yeah. in a studio apartment up yeah. in Primrose Hill. Frida, oh, no. Um, looking back, you mentioned that there weren't any red flags. Looking back now, could you notice any at all? And what are some precautions that you would tell people to take when going to auditions and castings by the cell? I would say bring a friend. Yeah. Let someone know exactly where you are and when. Mm -hmm. And then if they can't come, make sure that you text them when you're done. So they know. And if you don't text them, they they know where to find you. Yeah. Um, that's the only thing because I also don't want to stop young women working. Exactly. You don't want to say, oh, you can't work, it's dangerous. It's not dangerous. It just happens to be a few people that are dangerous yeah. to be more cautious. If you go, I have gone for job interviews in hotel rooms, you know, a suite, and you yeah. sit in the living room. Um, you know, just it is it is dangerous though because mm. people are getting more and more brave. Those yeah. guys are getting more and more brave. Yeah. So that would be my, my, my sort of go to like make sure someone knows where you are and at what time and text them if you think if they can come with you yeah really good advice um is there anything about human trafficking that you think people aren't aware of that they should know that it exists yeah people people walk i mean i did as well I walk around in my little bubble or mm. you know we live in the western world we're very lucky we yeah. have everything we need we're very you know we can do anything we want and women are strong you mm-hmm. know 
I lived in Malibu bubble. I didn't know it existed. Mm. And now I start, of course, start looking into it when we wrote the film and stuff. And yeah. it's huge. And people don't know. Yeah, that it could even happen in an area like, you know, Harley Street. Like, yeah, you wouldn't think when you picture trafficking no. for it to be in somewhere like that. It's no. Just, oh, my goodness. That's, That's the thing I'd like people to know, that it doesn't happen to just... Poor people with no passports and no money that come into the country, mm. any country. Yeah. Like if you live in, in the States, people coming in from Mexico, El Salvador, you know, they, they don't have any money, they have no passport. Yeah. Those are not always the victims. Yeah. It's us with money. Mm. Who, I'm not saying rich, but I'm saying people who actually live and breathe and work in a big city. Yeah. We're equal targets. Yeah. We're all the same. That's they don't really care. really important, yeah, yeah. To know that we're all equal targets. Wow. How did you manage to stay so in control of your life, not fall into a depression and remain so positive after this ordeal? I wasn't always positive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have our days. Um, I, I sort of made it almost go away in my head. Yeah. I wanted to just slip into the normal life of a London, people who live in London, and I want, we didn't want anyone to know about it Yeah. because I was embarrassed, especially with the police. Not really mm. treating it like something that actually happened. So I was really embarrassed. For many, many years, I told nobody. Wow. Yeah, and then I ended up um, around 29. I married a British guy. Yeah. And I said to him, I have something I want to talk to you about. Yeah. And I'm not, I said to him, I'm okay now. I just want you to know. Mm -hmm. Because it's important that you know me. And I told him. Yeah. And after about five years or so, or maybe less, three, he said, you should make a movie about that. And then we discussed whether I should make a movie, a documentary, or write a book. Yeah. And we couldn't quite um, figure out what route to go. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up making a movie to make it more accessible for people. Because not everyone wants to read books, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I love reading books. But, Same. Um, but I think a movie is very easy to just watch. Yeah. So we did that. But, th I mean, that was very cathartic yeah. in a way. So to tell and find the courage to tell it... Yeah. And then not be so embarrassed about it anymore. Yeah. Because of the response I got from the film and all these women. Yeah. It's unbelievable, actually. Yeah. It's beautiful and it's done exactly what I wanted to do. I had women coming forward to me um, just either sharing their story mm -hmm. or having watched a film and, you know, wanting to tell their friends and, you know, just kind of be aware. And exactly. So I am spreading a message that's good. Yeah. You know, it's an uplifting but also with some s seriousness in it. Yeah. That's really powerful, Frida. Thank you. Um, for anyone that has been through something like this, do you have any advice that you would give to them, especially if they don't want to report it or talk about it with anyone else? I mean, I didn't talk about it, as I said, for almost many, many years. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't support that. I think the best thing you can do is to talk about it because yeah. uh, there, you can't really get over it unless you open up and become yeah, vulnerable. Set it free. And people will never judge you for it, actually. Never. I thought they would. I thought, mm. oh, you stupid girl. Why would you, you know, that's kind of what you think about yourself. Yeah. You think other people are going to say the same, but they won't. They really won't. No. I think that's very important for all those girls that have been in similar situations or raped yeah. or abused of some sort. Yeah. Um, share. Yeah. Really share. Yeah. It takes balls to share, mm -hmm. but do it. Yeah. It's would you help. recommend therapy? Yes. I did yeah. one year. Ah, oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. Therapy and definitely talking about you, yeah. so. Lovely. Um, so, yeah, you were just talking about your film. You managed to flip the script and not become a victim of what happened to you and share your story in a way that gives you your power back. What made you decide to turn your story into the movie, movie Apartment 407 regarding selling Isabel and what made you want to star in it yourself? Good questions. Um... So, yeah, we had a bit of a, about a year or so discussing whether we should do the book, the documentary or the film. We yeah. didn't know yet. And then Glyn, my best friend who I have a production company with, ah. he said he would write the script. Yeah. So he sat with me for a few weeks, like recording it on his iPhone. Yeah. Just going through all the details. And that was quite harsh because I had then never told anyone apart from my mm. husband. I was like, woo. But we did it. Um, so I wanted to star in it. In fact, I didn't want to star in it first because yeah. I said, my husband said, let's, uh, why don't you star in it? I said, no, that's too embarrassing. Mm. It's too like, you know. So he pushed and pushed and pushed. And I, I was looking, thinking I could hire someone else who can do it really good. Yeah. 
and there's plenty of great actresses around. And then he finally said to me, people are going to take it in a different way if you are in it as well. They're going to mm-hmm. really listen. They're going to yeah. be like, what? She's in it and she's telling the story. This is, it becomes a very serious thing. Yeah, reenacting that is mad. Yeah. Wow. How did it feel reenacting that for your movie? You know, people ask that and they probably think that the rape scenes are the worst. Mm. But the rape scenes, yeah, they're not easy. Yeah. But the guys we hired were fantastic. And literally in between takes, we're laughing, hugging. Everything is really, really, really good. Yeah. Even if it's hor- horrendous scenes. Mm-hmm. And um, the atmosphere on the set was beautiful. Nobody oh. knew I was the real survivor. Wow. I didn't tell anyone apart from the director. Wow. So no one knew, no one treated me differently, you know, it was yeah. just another actress. I didn't want to be like, oh, watch out, she's wonderful. Yeah. Um, the worst scene for me to film was the one where I step into the apartment and he locks the door. Because I think for me, that's when I still had some choice, mm. you know, and I blame myself for that moment. The rest, I'm, I can't blame myself for because mm. I wasn't, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. That's really like interesting. Here you say I that. had, yeah, I still had that, and I, that that's when I really broke down and panicked, and I was like, oh, yeah. So. Wow! Even after the lock, you thought, like, should you unlock it or like run or hit him then? Yeah, I I, I was still thinking, I'm so close. Surely yeah. there's got to be a way. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah. So I used, to, but then of course the knife comes out, and you think, no. Yeah. Oh no, Frida. Um. So what do you think more that can be done to help survivors of human trafficking? Is there anything else that you think? people should do to help them more any charities or anything i definitely think charities should be set up yeah um, volunteer centers where they can just come in and share mm. i think sometimes when you are a victim survivor it's easier to share with someone you don't know okay because you don't have the shame mm. and you don't think oh they're, what they're gonna think of me because when you don't know them it's they just kind of feel sorry for you in a way yeah. but they don't so pity you but they just Kind of go, oh, how can we help? And yeah. then you get to talk. But if you have a family member, they're going to be, oh, my God, oh, my God. You know, they're going to have their reaction. Yeah. So you speak to someone who doesn't have, doesn't know you, they don't have a reaction like that. Yeah. That's easier. I think more centers should be set up. Because there's a lot of women that are abused, yeah. raped, trafficked, you know. No. Yeah. So yeah. They should have somewhere to go. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, well, lastly, I really, really admire your resilience your bravery and your strength. And again, I really want to thank you so much for sharing a bit of your story with me and us today. Um, With everything that you've been through and learned along the way and now thriving in your own independent life, what does it mean to you to truly give your all or nothing? I think in general in life, I'm, I'm all or nothing. Yeah. I go all the way and I never just drop either a project or a friend, you know, like I don't, I'm just, I'm always all or nothing. Yeah. I, yeah. I function like that actually. Yeah. They're quite black and white. Yeah. There are lots like of grey areas, but I, I try to be logic and be like, you know, it is it is all or nothing. Yeah. And even getting out of that situation, like you really had to give your all and yeah. you and you got out of it. Yeah. And I'm well very done. You should be very proud lucky. of yourself, Frida. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very lucky because most women don't. Oh no. So even afterwards I was thinking, I'm so lucky. It was only three days. Mm. It could be months. Mm. Um and I got out. I'm yeah. alive. So I I have to celebrate that rather than being depressed about it. You have days, but you really have to celebrate that you are actually fine, which is why I want to strengthen that it is a survivor. You are a survivor, not a victim. You are. You are. Yeah. It's amazing that you've taken on that mentality. Oh, wow. Thank you so much again for sitting down with me and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for having me. Thank you. (laughs)